We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church family. Hope you're all glad to be in God's house this morning, man, celebrating our 101st and 102nd baptism this morning, this year. That's awesome. Um, we got two more next service, too. That's awesome. Yeah, God is doing a powerful thing here, and I'm really glad that you're here to be a part of it. Uh, oh, grab your Bible and open up to James chapter 4. We're in a series right now. We're going through the book of James, kind of verse by verse, and exploring all the, the truth that God wants us to see. If you don't have a copy of God's word that you call your own, just grab the one from the chair in front of you and write your name in it and take it home with you, all right? We want everyone in this room to own a copy of God's word so you can have that as a gift today. Hey, today we're gonna talk about some warnings that we find in scripture. Have you ever noticed that pretty much every product you could buy these days, you find somewhere on there, there's gonna be a warning label, right? There's gonna be something on there and pretty much I'll tell you where warning labels come from, right? Somebody buys a product or, or creates a product, they wanna market it so they start selling it to people and then somebody gets hurt doing something they're not supposed to do with the product, so then they get sued, right? And then the, the company that creates the product is thinking, well, we don't wanna get sued again, so why don't we put a warning label on this thing so that this never happens again? Well, some of the warning labels have got to, you gotta wonder, like what was that original person thinking? I have a couple of them. Let me show you a, an example of a, war, a real warning label. Uh, remove child before folding. <laughs> like, get this, y'all, somebody, folded this thing with their child in it and got really upset when their child was hurt and a warning label, you know, here we go. Hey, here's the next one. Uh, toner from your printer, don't eat toner. I, 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 wouldn't you just love to sit in that courtroom and be like, so there I was eating the toner. There was no anything that said I wasn't supposed to and I got sick. Can you believe it? They owe me money, right? Do not eat toner. That should be like a duh sort of thing, right? Hey, here's another one. Uh, harmful if swallowed. Uh, fish agree with this, all right? It's not a good idea to swallow one of these. Don't do it. Okay, and, and here's the last one. I had like 12. Uh, this product moves when used. Um, I will say, if used properly. I'm sure there's another way to use it where it doesn't move, but here, here's the idea, though, with warning labels. Warning labels highlight uh, something where, you know, if you don't follow the label, if you don't do what it says, there's a potential to harm yourself, to get injured, or to cause a problem, right? So when James is writing this next passage of scripture we're going to go over today, what he's doing is he's providing a warning for us, and specifically in James 4, 11 through chapter 5, verse 6, what we're going to cover today, he has a warning for the rich, now, I know what just happened in here. Some of you are thinking, well, Matt, if you saw my bank account, right, you would know that this message is for other people in this room, but it's not for me, right? <laughs> you're thinking, this isn't a message for me. I'm not one of the rich. Well, believe it or not, if you're in this room right now, you are, for, for many of us, not everybody, for most of us, you, God showed enough grace to you that you were, were born into the United States of America. And believe it or not, in this room right now, uh, pretty much everyone in this room, there might be one or two exceptions, are richer in the top 20% of wealth in the entire world. All right, so you might be sitting here thinking, you know, I don't make a ton. We live paycheck to paycheck. I can't pay all my bills. But I want you to know, if you take your income and you compare it to the rest of the world, I hate to break it to you, you're rich. You got a ton of money. There's 80% of the world that would love to have the income that you have coming into your life right now. In fact, if you make, a, a, as, a, as a combined family income, if you have $90,000 combined income per year, you're in the top 
of all income earners in the world. So my point is, don't just discount everything I'm about to say because you're like, this doesn't apply to me. I want all of us to realize that maybe, maybe even this message is for the future. Maybe God has a blessing that's coming your way and you don't even know it yet. All of us can take something away from the warning that James is, has written in this letter that God wants us to know. Another thing, before we get into this message, I want to make sure everyone knows, is this is a warning for the rich, not a condemnation of the rich. In other words, God is not taking this and saying, listen, I want everyone who's rich to know that you're not supposed to be. That's not, that's not the point of this. It's not wrong to be rich. That's not what James is saying. James just says, if you have a lot of uh, blessing that's been given to you by God, I want you to be careful, and therefore I'm going to put a warning label on your wealth. I want you to be careful with it. And, and here's why, because wealth is very, uh, very powerful. When you have money, when you have resources, there's a lot of good you can do and a lot of evil you can do with money. And that's why it requires some warning labels. And so what James does in these next few passages we're going to read together is he's giving some warnings for the rich. And that's us in this room. Some richer than others. Some struggling to get by. But at the end of the day, all of us have received tremendous blessing from God just by being uh, in, in this community, all right? So here's what we're going to do. Let's start in verse 11 of James chapter 4, and we're going to find our first warning. It says, don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. But your job, ready for this? Your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you. God alone who gives the law is the judge. He alone has the power to save or to destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? That last sentence, if I could paraphrase that in Matt International Version Bible, right? Here's what it would say. Who died and put you in charge? God certainly didn't die. And he's not only the lawgiver, but he's also the judge. He's the one who decides how uh, you should and should not use the wealth that he's given to you. He's in charge of that. And what happens for a lot of us, here's the first warning that I want, it, you, there's no fill in the blank for this one, but it's number one, don't judge others' motives. When God has blessed others financially, it's not your job to spend their money for them. Have you ever noticed how easy it is for each of us to know what other people are supposed to do with their money? We, we know when other people spend money and they're like, well, they shouldn't have done that. Or they don't buy something, you're like, they should have really invested in that. They, I don't know what they were thinking, right? We're really good at spending other people's money, knowing what other people are supposed to do with their money. At the end of the day, the, the Bible says, listen, be very careful when it comes to judging how God has called other people to use the wealth that he's invested into them. We need to be very careful to not put ourselves in the place of judge. Let's, let's, uh, Let's not think about the things other people are doing with their money. Let's think about what we're doing with our money. The money that God has invested into you, what are you doing with that? That's your area of, you know, purview, all right? Now, here's the next thing. Number two, warning for the rich. Number two, don't be consumed by money. Don't be consumed by it. Another way to say this is don't worry about money. Don't worry about it. What does James say about that? He says in verse 13, Look here, you who say, Today or tomorrow we are going to a certain town, and we'll stay there a year, and we'll do business there and make a profit. You know, what? basically what he's saying is, To you who go and wake up and say, Tomorrow, here's the plan to make some money. Here's my plan. I got a plan. I'm going to go do this. Here's how I'm going to get some, uh, here's how I'm going to get that bread, right? Here's what I'm going to do. He says, Look here, you who make those plans. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like a morning fog. It is here a little while, and then it's gone. What you ought to say is if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. And, and so what James is getting at here is, is this idea of don't let money 
consume you. And for a lot of us, what it is, is money consumes so much of our thoughts that, that we, we have this whole one-year plan, we got this whole the eight-year plan, and we, got, we know exactly what we're going to do tomorrow, we're going to go here, we're going to do that, and we got this, this whole thing all mapped out, and we're concerning ourselves with coming up with our own plan for how to gain more financial wealth. And what, and what I want to make sure you understand is God's not saying it's wrong to have a plan. He's not saying it's wrong to have a plan. In fact, if you look at Proverbs 21.5, he says, good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. So if it's, it seems like God's word is saying, hey, it's not a smart to have a plan, but it's also saying you need to have a plan. So which one is it, right? It's actually both. When it comes to your finances, one of the warnings God gives you is you need a plan, but you shouldn't be the one coming up with it. In other words, here's two things. I, if, if these aren't in your notes. If you want to make a little sidebar, uh, two things I want to encourage you to do when you're developing a plan for what you're going to do for, for money when it comes to finances. The first thing I want you to think about is, is this. Let God provide the plan. Don't be so caught up and concerned with money that you're doing all the planning. Instead, trust God. Go to him in prayer and say, God, what is it that you want for my financial situation? Because you know what happens when we're in charge of the plan? Our plan is always, how do I get more of this? How do I put more away? How do I go on a bigger vacation? How do I buy a bigger car? How do I get more? Our plan is always going to be concerned with us. God's plan might be for you to give it all away. His plan might be for you to live on exactly what you're earning right now and not to grow, uh, go up on the ladder, but he, he's got a plan for you to, to, to thrive right where you are financially right now. Maybe he's got a plan for you to, to be financially blessed and to, 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 to have this really big blessing financially that's coming. I don't know what it is, but let God write the plan instead of you. The other part of that is not only let God write the plan, but let God reshape the plan. Because what happens for a lot of us, we come up with a plan that we believe God has given to us, and maybe even God did give to us, and we get so caught up in the final destination of the plan that we don't realize that God doesn't want us at the destination. He just wanted us in that direction for a season and wants us to pivot. You know, we have a lot of plans that we make in this church. Usually in the fall, our, our overseers, we go away for a retreat and we come up with our one year to five year plan. All right, we plan out pretty far, right? And then our executive team gets together and we take that, that plan that the overseers have given to us and we come up with our wildly important goals for next year. We already have all those things written down on paper, right? And then our staff gets together for a staff retreat, and we come up with all the, uh, here's the budget that we're going to need. Here's the programming calendar. We already have written down every event this church is going to do in December of 2024, right? We have a plan, but our plan, I love this word picture. We always say that our plan is wet cement, do you understand that word picture? It's like we, we understand that God is honored in planning. So we, we create the mold that God has given to us. God, what do you want this sidewalk to look like? And, and he lets us kind of mold it. And then we pour the concrete, but we do, we're very strategic to make sure that we keep the cement wet. And here's why. Because three months from now, God might say, thank you for honoring me in walking in this direction. I, that's what I wanted you to do. But now I want you to turn right and I want you to take this sidewalk a different direction. And so when, you, when God gives you a plan, don't get so, go so caught up and focused on the destination that you forget that God's will is more of a direction than a destination. And so when James gets to it, what he's really telling us, in fact, let me um, read another verse. In Proverbs 16, verse 3, it says, commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. It says in Proverbs 19, verse 21, you can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. And so pulling this back to James chapter four, if we go to the next verse in James chapter four, verse 16, it goes on and it says this. Remember, we're talking about 
creating a plan to consume more money, right? Or to get, get, gra- gather more money. And here's what it says. Otherwise, if you make all these plans on your own, it says, otherwise you are boasting about your own pretentious plans. And all such boasting is evil. So, so what is God getting at with this? I love the word pretentious. That this translation in the New Living Translation uses this word pretentious. And here's, here's what the dictionary says about this word pretentious. You ready? Pretentious is claiming that, that or behaving as if one is important or deserving of merit when such is not the case. It's when you pretend that you're the one responsible for coming up with your financial plan. That's pretentious because God's in charge. God's plan is the one that's going to prevail. So why not lay down our plan and say, God, I want you to provide the plan and I want to be willing to march into it no matter what it is. And I'm going to let you reshape it as we go, however you want to move this thing around. We don't want to be so pretentious in fact, really, if you think about it, what is it, what is it when you are the one creating your own financial plan? We call that being you know, consumed or worried. When you worry about your finances, what you're really doing is you're claiming to be the one responsible for making it all work out. When you are worried about your money, what you're really saying is, I'm, I'm the one who's in charge of all this. I'm the one who's got to make it all work. I'm the one who's got to figure out the plan. When God says, listen, you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. And I always use that verse, that, that verse we just read in James where it says, life is like a morning fog. It's here for a little while and then it's gone. I always use that verse whenever I'm officiating a funeral. Because it's an important reminder for each of us that on the span of eternity, your life is just this little itty bitty blip on that. You're only here, even if you live to a ripe 120 years old, all right? Your life is like a morning fog. It's only around for a little while in the span of eternity, and then you're gone. So why in the world would you take on the responsibility of figuring out what you're supposed to do with your time? Let God create the plan. Trust God with him. Don't get consumed by it. And when I say don't get consumed by it and don't worry about it, you know, uh, one of the verses that comes to mind in scripture, you've probably heard someone talk about this verse before. It says, the love of money is the root of all evil. Have you heard that before? It's from scripture. The love of money is the root of all evil. For a lot of us, what we do is we assume that that verse is talking about people with a lot of money. You know, all those people out there with a ton of money, they're the ones who have a love of money and their their love affair with money. That's the root of all evil. Those rich people are the problem. But think about, this, this truth. Scarcity of something is often a crater of an idol in your life. If you have very little money, you probably think about money more than you think. If you don't know how you're going to buy your next groceries, you probably stay up at night thinking about money. You probably are the one creating plans right now for how you're going to take care of that. How are you going to do this? How are you going to do that? We have to understand that on both ends of the spectrum, whether you have a lot of it or you have very little of it, all of us need to be careful not to be consumed and make an idol out of money. Let's just give our plans over to God and trust him with them. All right, here's the next warning. Uh, Let me read the verse first. James 4, verse 17 says, remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. This verse seems a little random. It's like, why is this verse in the midst of a verse uh, of a passage about finances? And we call this, what we call this the sin of omission, right? We, we know a lot of things. Hey, if I do this, it's sin. If I do that, it's sin. If I do this, it's sin. The Bible actually says that there are certain things that you know you're supposed to do. And if you don't do them, the sin of omission, that it's sin. And so the reason why this is included in a whole passage about a warning for the rich is, believe it or not, here's your next warning. You ready? Don't get so caught up in the don'ts that you miss the do's. We can get so caught up in the don'ts of of these warnings. And I know some of you are thinking, well, your whole message is, is seven don'ts. 
I get it. But here's the point, write those down and then make sure that you don't get so caught up in following the seven don'ts that you miss out on the things that you are supposed to do with your money. A lot of us are really good at, I I shouldn't spend my money on that. Uh, That would be a waste of money or God wouldn't be honored if I bought that. We've got the don'ts of life figured out for the most part. But what about the things that you're supposed, you're actually supposed to do with your money? And that when you don't do them, you got a sin problem. A short little list, a couple things. One, you should provide for those that you're responsible to care for. Listen, if you're in this room right now and you have people that are under your responsibility, one of the things that you should do with your money is provide for those that you love. That's a good thing to do. If you're not doing it, that's sinful. We should, here's another thing, we should treat people fairly with our money. We'll talk more about that in a minute. How about this one? We should be generous with our excess. Listen, if God provides more than you need to care for the people that you love, and you're sitting there thinking, I got more, I got extra. One of the things that God's word tells us to do is to go out into the world and make disciples and, and to build his church and to, to make sure other people end up eter- eternally in heaven. And you have the, the resources to make some of that, that happen and, and you choose not to, that can be a problem. Think about this. I wrote this down as a sentence. Stewardship is not just in knowing how to save, it's also in knowing how to spend. You can honor God through what you do with your money, what you spend with your money. And I want to make sure you remember this, what stewardship means, this word stewardship what it, what it means is that the money that you have, if you're a follower of Christ in this room right now, and maybe no one's ever told you this, you need to know, we believe that what you have, that paycheck you're going to receive this week, that money is not yours. It's God's. He's put it in your account to take care of it. He's put you as a steward over his money. And as a steward, you're basically an investee. God is investing his money in your life. He's saying, listen, I'm going to take what's mine, I'm going to put it in your account, and I'm going to let you be the investee. But I want you to turn, as from an investee, I want you to turn into an investor. Now, you get to take that money and invest it. You get to do good things with it. You get to to bring love and joy and life into this world, or you can invest it in things that are not good. Right, so what we need to understand is that everything we have is God's. And when you spend, remember there's the, um, the parable of the, the three servants and the master's going away and he entrusts his money to them. And one of them is the saver. He digs a hole in the ground and he puts the master's money in there and he's like, I know my master's gonna want this back, so I'm gonna save it. And when the master comes back, the, remember the other two, what, what did they do? They spent it. They invested it and saw a reward for their investment. And so when the master came back, one of them was like, master, I saved it. I, I didn't do anything wrong with your money. I just, I put it in the ground so you could have it back. And it, it didn't go well for that one, right? The other two recognized, I've been placed in stewardship over this. I'm going to use it now and invest it to fulfill God's purposes. So don't get so caught up in the don'ts that you miss the do's. Here's the fourth one. A warning for all of us in this room. Warning for the rich. Don't hoard money. Now, some of us are in this room and we're like, I don't struggle with this because I don't have anything left over, right? There's nothing to hoard. But maybe if you were in a situation where you did receive an extra blessing, you've had so much time that you haven't had much in the account that you immediately are like, I'm, I'm not spending any of this. I haven't had this in a long time. And you turn into a hoarder all of a sudden. The Bible says don't hoard your money. Here's how it says it. In chapter 5, verse 1 through 3, it says, look here, you rich people. <laughs> I love that. Look here, rich people. Weep and groan with anguish because of all the terrible troubles ahead of you. Your wealth is rotting away and your fine clothes are moth-eaten rags. 
Your gold and silver are corroded. The very wealth you are counting on will eat away your flesh like fire. This corroded treasure you have hoarded will testify against you on the day of judgment. Wow. That's a pretty powerful passage. Basically saying, listen, you probably all know this, right? You can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. Now, there's, there's nothing wrong. When I say take care of people that you love as one of the things you should do with your money, there's nothing wrong with making sure that maybe you leave an, invest, or an inheritance for those that you love. To, there, there's a line at some point. You're going to have to talk to the Holy Spirit and make sure you come up with his plan. Uh, there's a point at which you can, you can put some money in savings. You can make sure you're taking care of your family and your wife in retirement. I, I want to make sure that if I die tomorrow that my family's taken care of. So there's certainly room to, to be a, a good financial steward by putting some money away. That's not hoarding. Hoarding is when you're just gathering and collecting stuff as if you get to take it with you to the next life. You guys are probably familiar with the game, uh, the game of life, right? You set up the board, everybody picks a car, or you put yourself in it, right? And then you, you start off the game by choosing whether or not you're going to go to college or you're going to get a career, and then once you choose that, you, you get your career eventually, and you have your, your salary that you're going to earn every time you, you pass payday. And then you're going to have kids, or get married, and then have kids, and you're going to, uh, different good things and bad things happen to you on the road of life. And then eventually, you get to the end, and you figure out who wins, right? And how do we know who wins in the game of life? Whoever's got the most stuff. Right, you total up the homes and the cars and the children and the whatever and your money in the bank and whoever's got the most wins the game of life. That's the message of the world. That if you die with the most stuff, that you win. But the truth is, if you die with the most stuff, you die. Like you're still dead. There's a story of a man who was incredibly wealthy. And he was wealthy because he never spent his money on anything or on anyone. His own family was just like, he thought he was miserly, but he just had a ton of money. And when he died, he actually wrote in his will, I want to be buried with all of my money. And his wife and kids were talking to the lawyer and like, is there any way around this? And they're like, well, it's his will, it's his stuff, his money, you gotta, you gotta do it. You gotta bury him with his money. And so the funeral happens, they, they bury this guy and then three months later, they start noticing his wife is living just as extravagantly, maybe even more extravagantly than ever before. She's buying really fancy stuff and people are like, wow, what's the deal, what happened? And she said, well, uh, my husband wanted to be buried with all his money, so I wrote him a check. And he didn't cash it. <laughs> the check expired. Let's look at the next one. James chapter 5, verse 4. It says this, for, for listen, hear the cries of the field workers whom you have cheated of their pay. The cries of those who harvest your fields have reached the ears of the Lord of heaven's armies. I love how this is written. James goes out of his way to not just say, hey, you know those people that you cheated out of their wages so that you could have more and they would have less? Those people, those people are crying out, but they're not just crying out to God. I love the, the phrasing he uses. They're crying out to the Lord of heaven's armies. That God is hearing their cries for the way you have mistreated people financially. And so what does this teach us? Here's the next one. Don't pursue dishonest gain. Don't collect more for yourself by being dishonest with others. It's easy to go out in this world and trick people who are gullible, it's easy to take advantage of people who maybe aren't as savvy as you. It's easy to find people who will work for way less than they should be earning and because you just found a way to take advantage of their vulnerability. We see that all over the place in this world of people taking advantage of others financially. And the Bible says, listen, don't add to your own bank account by dishonest means. 
that can mean a lot of different things. You know, one of the ways that some of us add to our bank account through dishonest means is we, we cheat on our taxes. Ooh. And then don't, don't get me wrong. If you can find a legal loophole to pay as little tax as you possibly can, do it, right? That's just called being a good steward of money. But some of us, you know, there's no loophole. You just aren't telling people about things that you're supposed to be telling people about, and you're not paying what you're supposed to. That's gain through dishonest means. That's dishonest gain. Or when you have an employee or, or someone that you're doing a business relationship with, and you're intentionally withholding something. Yeah, you can buy my, my vacuum on Facebook Marketplace. It works great, maybe, right? That's gain through dishonest means if it doesn't really work the way you're saying it does. Be honest with people, and God will bless it. Earn money and spend money fairly. And here, here's the next one, number six. Don't waste money. Don't waste it. Let's look at the verse that goes with it. James 5, the next verse, verse 5, says, You have spent your years on earth in luxury, satisfying your every desire. You have fattened yourselves for the day of slaughter. You have just invested. I invested into you, and then you took everything I put in your account, and you spent it on yourself. You wasted it. And by the way, again, I want to make sure I'm really clear here. It doesn't mean that God doesn't ever bless you so that you can spend any money on yourself. I assume that many of you are going to leave here today and maybe go buy some food for you to eat. Maybe you're going to buy something really nice that really tastes delicious. You're going to spend a little more than you normally would. Maybe some of you, my family, we're leaving today. Uh, as soon as third service is over, we're going on vacation for the week, right? Does that mean that there's Matt spending money on himself? No, I think there's, there's a fine line, and we got to all find it in understanding at what point are you spending money in a way that's in alignment with the Word of God, where you're investing in things that matter, investing in things that count versus just indulging and fattening yourself for the day of slaughter. There's a line. I'm not gonna be the judge where that line is in your life. God's the judge and you gotta find it. And you gotta be careful not to waste the investment he's given to you and put in your account. Here's the fifth one or the seventh one. Warning for the rich, don't exploit others with the power of your wealth. Don't exploit others with the power of your wealth. We see in James 5, verse 6, it's going to be our last verse today, it says this, you have condemned and killed innocent people who do not resist you. I know what maybe some of you are thinking in this room is I've never condemned or killed anyone with the way I've handled my money. No one's ever been put in prison because of the way I handle my money. No one's ever been killed because of how I handle my money. But that, that's not the point. The point is that back in the day, in the system that James was writing about, it was very easy to exploit the poor when you were rich. And by the way, the same is still true today. It's very easy. If you, if, if I, I don't have a, a, a ton of money, right? I'm not, a, I, I understand I'm wealthy compared to the rest of the world. But if I were to take, you know, some billionaire to court in a civil case, I probably would not hire the best lawyer because I can't afford a really great lawyer. And then they would hire a really great legal team that would bury me in paperwork. And I would just be, you know what? The system's a bit rigged for people who've got a lot of money. Can we all just nod our head and agree to that? Well, it was even worse in James's day. The wealthy could take the poor to court, and, and because, you know, there's a saying in, in, in the law, a good lawyer knows the law. A great lawyer knows the judge. <laughs> you know, back in the day, you can take someone who's poor to court, and you know all the right people, you hang out with the judge, you play golf, and you got some money moving around, and, and you could get the, to a point where somebody could actually be executed because of their debt. Or even worse, uh, really starve to death because you've stripped every last little penny they've got from them because of your greed. Now, again, you're probably thinking, I've never done that to anybody. 
But here's the point. All of us have the ability to choose, to vote with our finances, what industries, what businesses, what people are, are benefit from the way we spend our money. We can be conscientious about making sure that no one is exploited in the way that we spend our money. There are industries out there, right, where, you know, if I buy this, there's, there's children being exploited somewhere because of my investment. Hey, when I go and I spend, I, I, you know, maybe it's not, maybe you're not the problem. Maybe you don't have a problem with gambling, all right? And you're saying, you know, I just like to go and just, it's just a hundred bucks. It's fine. I got it all under control. I walk into the casino live, right? And I just have a little bit of fun. But maybe you have to understand that when you do that, you're investing money in an industry that exploits people, that has them entrapped. I think about the pornography industry. You might think, now we already know outside of finances, pornography is not something that we should consume as followers of Jesus. But I want you to understand that when you invest money into that industry by consuming it, you, you're not going to get around the truth that that industry enslaves and entraps people. So here's the point. When you spend your money, you have the ability to be conscientious in how you spend it to make sure that your wealth isn't exploiting others. So here we are at our moment where we ask God what he wants us to do with this information. And here's what I wanna ask you to do. This three word prayer, what now God, that you're gonna see on the screen behind me, there it is. I want you to pray this prayer right now where you sit. Ask God what he wants you to do with the warnings that he's just given to you. And I believe, like I said, that you are wealthy. You might not feel it today. Your bank account might not reflect it today. But I want you to know you have access to more than 80% of the people in the world when it comes to your finances. For many of us, we're in the top five or even maybe 1%. What does God want to open your eyes to today in how you handle your money? You know, it's a very practical message. There's seven things I want to encourage you to choose one of these areas where you need to make some changes to be a better steward of the money that God has entrusted to you. You know, briefly looking at the list, maybe you find yourself often judging how other people use their money. And you have no idea that God has a plan and he's using that investment that they've made to somehow build his kingdom. I have no idea. Maybe you're constantly consumed by thoughts of how you're gonna earn your next buck and you need to let God shape that plan. Maybe you're so caught up in what you're not supposed to do with your money that you're forgetting that God has provided all sorts of opportunities for you to spend and invest in his kingdom and the Great Commission. Maybe you're hoarding it. Maybe you're gaining it dishonestly and you need to figure out Maybe there's someone in your workplace right now that you need to give a raise to tomorrow. Maybe you're wasting it. Maybe you're exploiting someone. I don't know what it is. Let God share that with you and I will write that down on your notes and do something about it. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for very practical messages. I love it when I open up your word and there's not a bunch of like having to figure out what this word means in Greek to understand what you're trying to say. God, we just open up this passage and we see that you're warning us. You're giving us some helpful advice for how to handle the blessing that you've given to us responsibly. Thank you for entrusting your money to us. Help us to use it in a way that honors you and builds your kingdom and builds others up. God, we love you and we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.